Now it's nine, so let's get started. So uh, T-Science Tuesday, uh, number two is happening. We're talking about aftertaste. Um, and specifically, I picked this topic because of this concept in the tea world or tea tasting world um, called hui gan. And hui gan is, uh, literally means returning sweetness. Um, I've also heard people use the term hui tian, which tian is another word for sweet. Um, I think tian is more like literally sweet is used for when you're just talking about like the taste of sugar. And I'm not sure really what the difference between those two is. I'm not a native uh, Mandarin speaker or even like a good Mandarin speaker at all. So <laughs> I don't actually know the difference between those words, but that's the kind of term where that's the term we're talking about today or what I want to kind of focus on. And what it is, is it's this sweet taste after you swallow the tea that sometimes lingers for a very long time, for hours after you've um, been drinking some tea. And usually it's something you, that you hear talked about with raw poor tea, um, but I've tasted it in really good green teas as all, also. Hello, the god of tea. Whoa, that's a cool username. Um, yeah, all hail the god of tea. Um, so I was really confused about Hui Gan for a long time about this sweet aftertaste. When I started as at grad school at Tufts, um, I started to, I was there to work on this tea project and we had a panel, a tasting panel, and we were getting trained to taste tea. And one of the things we were supposed to rate in the tea was this aftertaste, this hui gan, this uh, sweet aftertaste. And I really didn't know what I was looking for. Even though I had been drinking tea for a long time before that, I'd always sort of chalked up this hui gan thing to being like, ah, it's in your head, right? It's not real. Um, and so other people are tasting things that they just, they've said, oh yeah, this tea has a lot of this hui gan. And I would taste it and I'd go, I don't really get it. Um, and I sort of convinced myself that what it was, yeah, we're talking about hui gan. And, and feel free to chime in if you have different ideas than me. Um, so, you know, sort of at the time, what I came to the conclusion was what they're talking about was the sort of sweet aroma that you get after you swallow. Now, I don't think that's actually what Hui Gan is, um, but that's something I want to start with. So that idea of, of when you swallow something, so you can try this if you're drinking tea, you can, oops, I got to pour my tea here. You can smell your tea um, and then take a sip and then swallow and then sort of as you release that swallow think about the concentrate on the aromas that you're that you're getting and you sort of breathe out after you swallow so that is what's called that aroma that you get after you swallow yeah i'd agree i'd say that aftertaste is not aroma but this is this is where my brain was when i started grad school um so that that breathing out and that smell you get that's called retronasal olfaction so the way you normally smell, uh, the regular way, through the front of your nose, is orthonasal olfaction. Ortho is like straight, it's the straightest route, right? It's right through the front of the nose and retronasal is from the back. So I printed out some visuals here. Um, so your nose is actually connected to your throat. Um, so here's, oh, where's my little highlighter pointer? So there's your nose and you have these big sinuses, these big cavities in your face. And um, it's actually, so when you're smelling, the smell molecules or whatever are going through here, but in retronasal olfaction, they're going backwards um, through the back of your throat and up and, and hitting your the same um, uh, scent receptors. And what's really cool about that is there are certain aroma compounds that actually smell different depending on whether you've smelled them orthonasally or retronasally. Um, <clears throat> so when I take a sip of certain teas, especially raw pores, I swallow and I breathe out, often I get this sort of honey aroma, honey fragrance. Um, and so at the time, I thought that's what everyone was talking about when they were talking about Huigan. That's not it though. So hui gan is an actual taste. So this sweet aftertaste is actually a, a lingering sweetness that you get. I usually sort of sense it on kind of the back of my tongue on the sides. Um, sort of taste it when you, it's like a fleeting thing. It's like, oh, oh, there, I got a little bit of it, right? Um, and it's just sort of like, I feel like it's when you salivate a little bit, you taste it. 
Um, when you swallow, you taste it a little bit and it's like hard to pinpoint and it's, it's kind of barely there sometimes. Um, I've heard other people say that they taste it like on their, on their teeth or something after they've been drinking, drink, been drinking tea for a long time. Um, hi, Bang Tea Company, welcome. We're talking about aftertaste in tea, um, specifically the sweet aftertaste that you get from green teas and pours. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's an actual sweet aftertaste. Um, and let's see, what was I gonna say about that? Well, I can just jump into, I'll, I'm, I had a bunch of things to say about aftertaste, um, but maybe I'll just jump into some of the science stuff that I learned about it. And so the reason I picked this topic really is because of this tea, this paper, um, which I will, if you're watching it on YouTube later, I'll put a link to it in the, in the description. Sorry, it's behind a paywall. Um, don't pay for it. Never pay for academic papers. The authors don't get any of that money. Uh, just, you know, if you have trouble finding it, just DM me and I'll help you figure out how to get it. But this paper is called Improving the Sweet Aftertaste of Green Tea Infusion with Tannase. Ah. So what is tannase? Tannase is an enzyme. Um, <clears throat> enzymes do, they help chemical reactions along. And this particular enzyme is responsible for um, chopping a bit off of some of the catechins in tea. So I just said a bunch of science words. Catechins are this group of chemicals in tea that are the antioxidants, basically, that we talk about. When we talk about, oh, this tea has a lot of antioxidants, you're talking about catechins for the most part. Um, EGCG is one that you maybe have heard of. That's an acronym for epigallocatechin gallate. Um, and they are pretty complex molecules. Last time I built like a molecule of caffeine to show you, I don't have enough parts to build uh, the catechins, um, but they all kind of have a similar structure. And they have these rings. So this is kind of the most basic form here. That is catechin. Um, and then as you sort of add bits to it, so this one has like an extra OH group compared to this one, um, we, we get more complicated molecules. And then over here on the other side, these are all the ones where their names end in gallate. And that's this bit, which I will circle here. I don't have like, I need a whiteboard. Ooh, that's what I need. So that's the gallate group. And all of these have that gallate. So EGCG has at the end of it, let's see, which one's EGCG? That's this very last one here. EGCG has this gallate group. Um, ECG has a gallate group and GCG has a gallate group. And so tannase, that enzyme in this paper, it chops that gallate group off. And that improves the sweet aftertaste, which is really cool. Why does it do that? So it turns out catechins all have really different flavors uh, or tastes depending on which catechin it is. And the ones without the gallate groups, I'm sorry, the ones with the gallate groups tend to taste bitter and astringent. And the ones without the gallate groups tend to taste sweet and they have that sweet aftertaste. So that is probably where that hui gan comes from is those uh, catechins without the gallate groups. Now, <laughs> We're not totally sure because in this paper, all they did was add the tannase to the tea, measure the catechins, and measure people's perception of the sweet aftertaste. Um, so there's a lot of things going on there. And in fact, they had a follow-up paper just this year, this one, improving the taste of autumn uh, green tea with tannase. So basically taking the same method and trying to apply it to autumn tea. And one of the things that they do differently in this paper is here, they say, oh, the sweet taste is the gallate groups that you've now freed um, from these big catechins and that this gallic acid is what it becomes when it's freed off is um, what tastes, what gives you that sweet aftertaste. So we don't actually really know. Also pH changed in, in their study, they measured the pH and when they use the tannase, it makes it changes the pH, which changes the way we taste bitter, which changes the way we taste sweet. So there's a lot going on. We still don't know for sure what that sweet aftertaste is, um, but I bet it does have something to do with the catechins. Um, so yeah, so that's really cool. Good morning, Bang Tea Company. So um, what I'm drinking, by the way, is a 
uh, a pour from, I can't remember the name of it. It's from Van Cha though, um, which is in Vancouver, V-A-N-C-H-A, and I had a really uh, great time there. Um, so anyway, that's a, a good tea. Uh, and this does have a lot of that Hui Gan, I think. Yeah, we don't have a great understanding. I, so another paper I'll show you in a second here, I was reading last night and I was like, oh my gosh, we don't know how tongues work. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, we really don't even know how tongues work. Um, probably, you know, many of you, depending on when you went to elementary school or whatever, learned about this, like the tongue map, right? Where certain parts of your tongue taste, the, the tip tastes sweet and the side tastes sour. And that's actually not true. Um, but it's not like they lied to you. It was just like, we didn't, know how tongues that was the best model of how tongues worked for a really long time and then we found out that that's not how tongues work that you can taste sweetness all over your tongue um you, you taste it better in certain parts than others but there's not like this okay this is the sweet tasting part this is the sour tasting part so the other reason why i think these catechins are, are likely to be the culprit is um because of how long that sweet aftertaste in tea lasts, that hui gan, it lasts a really long time. In these catechins, what they do is they they um, they bind to, to proteins. So their job in, in the tea plant, or one of their jobs, they have many jobs actually, but one of their jobs is a defensive chemical. And when, a, when an insect, or a, actually not an insect, when a mammal, um, these are specific to mammals, when mammals bite into plants, um, catechins and other related chemicals, um, they go through that oxidation, just like we have when we make tea, right? When you make black tea, you get these chemicals are oxidizing. And um, one of the things that they do when they oxidize like that is they bind to proteins. And that makes the whatever meal that animal is eating less nutritious. And so it's going to learn to avoid things with a lot of those tannins, a lot of those polyphenols, catechins, so are all kind of the same family there. And um, it also gives it like an astringent taste, a dry feeling in your mouth, because what's happening there is it's binding up all the proteins in your saliva and, and changing the texture of your saliva, which makes it feel dry. I'm gonna do another episode, I think, on mouthfeel at some point. Um, we can talk about that. Um, but that lingering, that lingering sweetness, and it also sort of builds. Like if you take one sip of a, a poor tea, you're probably not gonna be experiencing that sweet aftertaste. But if you're drinking it all morning, you're more likely to be experiencing it. So it's this building thing. Um, so the other interesting thing about this sweet aftertaste, which by the way, aftertaste, um, I could be wrong, but I don't know much about wine, but I think that in wine terms, what we're talking about here is finish. Um, I'm not sure if those are exactly the same thing. Finish may include things besides just like basic tastes, like sweet, sour, salty, bitter, umami. It might be also including aromas and things like that retronasal olfaction I talked about. I don't actually know. I don't, I don't drink much wine. I don't know much about wine. Um, uh, but this uh, sweet aftertaste in, in tea, um, ooh, what was I saying? It's likely due to the the catechins, anyways. That's that's my best guess so far. I think that's the best we know. Um, so the other thing, what time is it? The other thing I wanted to talk about or wanted to mention is I found. Oh yes, I remember now. Yeah. So the in 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 Chinese culture or in in tea culture, they often say that the sweetness comes from bitterness. So that you have to, you taste something bitter and it turns into sweet, into that sweet aftertaste. Um, and I think that's really a cool concept. Um, and I think there might be some, you know, validity to that, that the bitter and the sweet go together. Um, one reason is that these catechins, some of them do taste bitter and some of them taste sweet. And so if you just have more catechins overall, you're probably going to get more bitterness, but you may also get more of that sweet aftertaste. Um, so they are connected in that way. And I was sort of wondering more about that and how tasting, how aftertaste works on a physiological level. And I came across this paper. Um, 
sweet, bitter, and umami receptors, a complex relationship. And I was like, ooh, that sounds cool. This is not my field. I do not do taste physiology at all. I know nothing about it. So I'm not gonna pretend that I understood this paper really well, um, but I'll tell you some tidbits that I did understand. Um, first of all, we have one receptor. So receptors are these molecules on, on, our, on our taste bud cells here. Uh, we have one receptor for sweet and we have many receptors for bitter. And that makes sense because you really only want to be tasting sugar as sweet, right? Um, and you want to be able to detect, detect lots of bitter things which are potentially toxic um, that you know are going to taste bad. You don't want to eat them if they're really, really bitter. So that makes sense. But also the, these receptors are, are related. They're, they're structurally similar and they maybe share a, an evolutionary history. That, that I'm not exactly sure about that. Um, but I think that's what they're saying in this paper. But the really cool thing about this that I think is, is amazing, um, molecules have handedness or certain molecules do and they call it you know chirality a left-handed version and a right-handed version. So certain molecules exist in a left-handed and right-handed version. For example, one of the chemicals in tea is L-theanine. That L indicates that it's the left-handed version. Uh, the L doesn't mean left, but you know, it's, it's one-handedness of, of that molecule. And then there's also a D-theanine, is the other, um, what we call stereoisomers, mirror images. And those mirror images for a lot of molecules one version tastes sweet and the other one tastes bitter, which is amazing to me, that your tongue can tell the difference between those two mirror images. So especially amino acids, there are certain amino acids that the, the, the left-handed version tastes sweet and the right-handed ta version tastes bitter or the other way around. Um, and that's really cool. But there are also other kinds of um, variations that can change, that can flip that bitterness and sweetness. Um, and one of them is like the stereochemistry is what we, we talked about, sort of the three-dimensional aspect of it. And in these diagrams, this is where I should have built a, mo a model for you guys. In these diagrams, you can see there's these sort of wedges and some of them are solid, uh, like this one here is this solid wedge, and some of them are these like dashed lines. So this is actually indicating that this, this piece of the molecule is actually coming out towards you. And this piece of the molecule is actually going back. So the difference between these two, this catechin and this epicatechin, is just the direction that this piece is going. It's going backwards, the same direction as this OH. Here, it's going forwards, which is the opposite direction of this OH. And those can flip around sometimes in certain molecules. And something as simple as that can change the way something tastes from bitter to sweet. So that's really cool. <laughs> and the other really cool thing that I learned from this is that sometimes the concentration matters. So something in large concentrations might taste bitter, but when it's really dilute, it might taste sweet. Um, and uh, or might have a sweet taste, but a bitter aftertaste is another thing like saccharin, right? Saccharin is this artificial sweetener that we don't really use very often because it has a really bitter aftertaste, even though it tastes sweet. So these sweet and bitter taste receptors are, they're different, they're different receptors, but they're related, they're connected. Um, and also we have molecules that can sort of flip and taste both ways. So this may also help uh, explain in the future and again like I don't fully this is I don't I don't do tongue science <laughs> I do tea science um, but this may in the future sort of explain better where we get that that sweet aftertaste from that that uh, that's in tea that bitterness turning to sweetness it may have something to do with the different um, versions of those molecules we call them isomers um, and whether they're uh, that piece is flipping forwards or it's flipping back it may change the way that we perceive the taste. So, most intriguing, Eric T. Sleuth says, most intriguing, I never knew that high school chemistry is bullocks, <laughs> the direction thing. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's, you know, this is why I love talking about tea is because I, I think that there's so many different aspects of science that you can talk about using tea. And it's a lot more interesting when you have like some point of reference to think about um, instead of just, you know, 
here's molecules, memorize them kind of thing. So, uh, so yeah, I think, I, you know, again, I don't fully understand the, the paper about the, the tongue stuff, but I think it's really, really cool to learn more about that. Um, one thing that you might notice if you ever uh, travel to China and drink tea there um, or know things about Chinese cuisine um, is that aftertaste uh, is valued a lot more, I think, than in American culture. So that's something that I found really interesting um, doing my research in China during the summers. Um, in the Western world, we often don't think about aftertaste or we often design foods specifically to not have aftertaste. So a lot of snack foods and stuff in America are, are actually designed to not have an aftertaste so you keep eating more. Um, but in China, you'll see a lot more of an emphasis on aftertaste and also on mouthfeel, which again, I might talk about in a separate episode. Um, and so like the ideal green tea in, in uh, China is something that may not be the ideal green tea to Americans. Um, a good green tea in China is often something that has very little flavor, uh, or very little taste, but has a lasting aftertaste and has a really good mouthfeel. Feels nice and silky and smooth in your mouth. And you could take that tame, same tea and give it to, you know, a, a group of Americans and they would probably say, you know, this doesn't really taste like much. Even people that are into tea, you know, even people that are, that are trained tasters, uh, not just random people off the street, um, you would get these cultural differences. And so I think one of the reasons that, that, um, uh, that this concept of hui gan, this returning sweetness, which now I can definitely taste as a sweet taste, a literal taste on the back of my tongue, Fleeting, occasional, but I can taste it. Um, the reason that I was not picking up on that immediately is because, you know, I have a Western palate and I'm not used to thinking about aftertaste. Um, and it takes practice to think about that. And I've heard people, like, I've heard um, Shoen, who I, she probably doesn't want me calling her out. I know she's always like, don't repeat anything I say on the internet. But uh, she's a wonderful teacher. This is the owner of Floating Leaves Tea. Um, she's talked about tasting teas, you know, lower and lower in your throat even, even than just sort of the back of your tongue. And I find that really interesting. I've never, I don't really, to be honest, I have no idea what she's talking about when she says that. <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I'm like, I, whatever you say, Shoen. Um, but there are taste buds. You do have taste buds for, for bitter and for sweet in your throat um, and in your stomach even. Now, they're not connected to your brain in the same way because they're not meant for conveying like taste in a conventional sense, but they're there, they're giving your body helpful information about the food you eat. And so it's possible that um, I, I could imagine with some practice that you could possibly, you know, rewire your brain to pick up on some of those taste buds that are lower and lower in your throat. I, don't take my word for that. I have no idea if that's actually true or actually what's going on. Um, but I just think it's, it's kind of interesting to hear someone talk about taste in a way that I've never experienced it. And I can't even imagine, because I don't even know what she's talking about when she says that. Um, uh, let's see, uh, tea sleuth says, oh yeah, Korean, Korean green teas. Yeah, they definitely have a lot of that mouthfeel and aftertaste, um, but are really, really light and delicate. Um, and, and, you know, many Americans would be like, doesn't taste like anything. Um, and yeah, uh, it's hard and needs concentration. Oh, about, about tasting tea uh, lower. So have you, I'm curious, have you experienced that, that tasting, tasting of a tea low, sort of lower in your throat than the back of your tongue? Um, I would be curious to hear more about it. So uh, anyway, I think, uh, let me just check the time here. That's probably all I have to say. Oops, sorry, my kettle is really loud. Um, Ho Yun, yes, took a couple years. Oh yeah, okay, cool. We'll have to talk about that more sometime. Um, you've tasted that Bang, Bang's Tea Company says they've only tasted that with certain teas. Yeah, it's definitely, I mean, especially even this Hui Gan, this aftertaste is definitely not something that's in all teas. You're not gonna get it all the time. Um, uh, Shoen's Lala Shan Hong Shui. Yeah, I haven't tried that. Maybe I'll have to try that and, and really, 
practice and concentrate and I may be able to understand what this is, what's going on here. Um, so anyway, I think that's all I have to say about aftertaste. Um, and next week, anybody remember what the topic is next week? I should have it up, but I don't remember. I'm sorry. Check my website, ericrscott.com. There's a blog post and uh, there's a little blog tab. You can click on it and get the, the syllabus for the class. And um, I'm still thinking about possibly changing the time. I got to work it out uh, with uh, my wife and see um, how that's how it's going to work and all that. Uh, it's just harder for me to do it after work than it is before. But it might uh, might be worth it. Um, I think probably more people would be able to join. So uh, anyways, thank you guys for joining the, who are here on the live stream. And thank you guys for asking questions and, and uh, making comments and all that. And yeah, see you next Tuesday. Bye.